So one way around it that avoids doing global backpropagation is to say what we're going to do is we're going to actually have gazillions of local objective functions. So the way we're going to scale things, you naturally think I get a little neural net, it works. I have a little neural net with this objective function. I can train it, that's fine. What if I want a big neural net? You try the same training algorithm, it doesn't work. But what if I had lots of little neural nets, each with its own objective function, and envision they could all be spatially local? I give it its own objective function, so I'm never trying to learn lots of parameters all at once from one objective function. And that works. Um, it doesn't work as well as backpropagation, but it does scale up much better to larger nets made of lots of local groups. So the question is, where do you get these local objective functions? Um, and here's one possibility for vision. You take patches of image and you have a little net that extracts something, a vector that's going to represent what's going on in the patch of image. And you say, I'd like to extract vectors that agree with the vectors extracted by other patches for this same image, but disagree with the vectors extracted for other images. So this is called contrastive unsupervised learning. And it turns out you can do that in multiple levels. So you're doing learning on local patches, trying to get them to agree with other local patches at the same level, trying to get the outputs to agree. You're also doing that at multiple levels. And if you're very persistent, you can make that work moderately well. It works better than all the other biologically plausible learning algorithms I know about. Um, it still doesn't work nearly as well as backpropagation though. And there's a paper about that in ICLR by Meng Yi Ren, who did all the difficult work. Um, the description I gave of it is slightly false, so you could understand it easier. Um, but the paper's there, so I don't feel it's dishonest. Um, it took a lot of hard work, and it's a fairly dense paper. OK, now let's go to. Um, the central issue of this talk is how agents share knowledge. It's all about communication between different agents. So what I'm doing now is trying to communicate knowledge to you, and I'm doing it very inefficiently. And the way I'm doing it is I'm producing strings of words. In old-fashioned AI, what you would have done is said, what's going on is you're then going to clean up those words into a logically unambiguous language, and you're going to put them in your brain. And that's what, that's what teaching is. Um, that's actually wrong. That's not how it works. Um, how it wor really works, I believe, is this. I produce strings of words, and you try and figure out how to change the connection strengths in your brain so that you would have said that. And that's a very different process. That's distillation. That's a very different process from just storing strings of words or storing even cleaned up strings of words. You're trying to figure out how to change trillions of weights in your brain so that that will be a reasonable thing to say. That is, if you believe me. Um, so that's a difficult way to share knowledge. And digital computers have a much better way to share knowledge. So they can do weight or gradient sharing. So suppose I have a big artificial neural net with a trillion connections. If I have it on a digital computer, I can make exact copies of it on lots of different digital computers. And each copy can go off and look at a different bit of the internet and figure out how it would change its weight so that it would have said that. And then it can take that weight change that it would like to make, and it can talk to all the other computers, and they can all agree to average all their weight changes. This is a simplification, but if you know, yeah, it's a simplification, but it's basically that. They average all their weight changes, and then everybody's learn, everybody knows what each person, each digital computer learned. So basically, it's what, what educators would love, which is I can take what's in my brain and can just plonk it in your brain. The hell with all this trying to predict what I would say. I just want to take what's in my brain and put it in your brain. And these digital intelligences can do that. And they do it by just, they all agree on the weight change, and now they all know what all of them learned. So imagine if we had 10,000 people, and whenever one of us learned something, all of us knew it. That would give you 
a tremendous advantage. And that's the advantage that digital computation has. In addition, it's got the advantage that it can use backpropagation, which is probably a better learning algorithm because that can go through lots and lots of layers of neurons and compute exactly the correct gradient. None of this guess a direction and see how well it works and hope you can average away the variance. Um, it's a better learning algorithm. So all of this came as a tremendous relief to me because I've spent the last few years trying to come up with biologically plausible learning algorithms that work as well as backpropagation. And I finally decided maybe there aren't any, maybe backpropagation is actually better. Um, and that's what I think I now believe. So I just want to remind you that you pay a tremendous cost to get this. And the cost you pay is that they have to be digital computers. They have to be fabricated precisely so they um, do exactly what they're told to do at the level of the instructions. And it uses a lot of energy. Um, distillation is what we use if we've got biological neural networks or if you've got two digital networks that have completely different architectures. Um, but it's got a much lower bandwidth. So if you've got a, a digital model with a trillion connections, they all go off and look at some data, then they average their weights. When they're averaging their weight changes, that's a trillions of bits that are being communicated. When you try and predict a sentence that I say, when you try and change your weights so you predict the sentence, that's hundreds of bits at best. Um, if you're Carl, it's about two bits because you knew what I was going to say anyway. Um, so it's much lower bandwidth. So here's the story so far. There's two very distinct ways to do computation. And the primary way in which they differ is in how you communicate knowledge between different agents. So in digital computation, you use weight sharing. And you've got this tremendous bandwidth for sharing what each agent learned. In biological computation, you can use very low power if you make use of the analog properties of the hardware. Um, but now sharing knowledge is a slow and painful business. So now let's look at large language models. Because every AI talk now has to get to large language models eventually. Um, they're quite interesting. They use digital computation. So you have lots of different copies of the same set of weights running on different computers when it's learning. And they all look at different bits of the internet. Um, and that allows them to see a huge amount of data and consolidate all that knowledge because they can share what they learn. And so if you look at large language models, they have about a trillion weights and they know probably a thousand times as much as any one of us. They, they kind of know everything. GPT-4 sort of knows every plausible thing, every reasonable thing it knows. Um, now we have a hundred trillion connections. So we've got a hundred times as many connections. Um, so we're really not using all that power, um, but it's because we can't see enough data. And if only we could get the knowledge from other people, maybe we could use it all. But they've got a thousand times more knowledge in 1% of the connections, which sort of confirms the argument they've got a better learning algorithm. The combination of backpropagation with this easy communication between different agents with the same weights um, means they basically got a much better learning algorithm. Now, it's presently being used to steal all our knowledge. Um, sorry, steal's not the right word, particularly in the current political context. It's to acquire our knowledge um, by using distillation. So these digital agents that can share knowledge, each agent, when it tries to get knowledge from the web, is using distillation to get the knowledge. It's looking at what people said and trying to change its weight so it would have said the same thing which isn't a very efficient way to get knowledge. But um, there's lots of them, and we run them for a very long time. And so it can basically learn everything people know in a few months on a lot of computers. It's even using an inefficient form of distillation, because distillation is quite efficient if you look at the teacher's probabilities for a large bunch of alternative classes. Um, what the digital models are doing when they acquire knowledge from documents on the web is the document on the web is the teacher and they just just look at the word that the person that the writer generated next they don't get to see the whole distribution 
They could learn much faster if they did, but they just get to see a stochastic choice from that distribution. But that's good enough so they can learn. Now, if you had these large neural, digital neural nets running on multiple different computers, and they got knowledge directly from the world, they could probably get knowledge much faster. So if, for example, they were predicting the next frame in a video, if they wandered around with the camera on their head and tried to predict the next frame in a video, or if they got a robot arm and try and predict what will happen when they move their arms around, they could probably learn much faster. So the large language models are kind of, they're learning fairly abstract stuff, which is good, but they don't have much bandwidth because they're just learning from a low bandwidth string of words. Um, I suspect that these large, these large models will get a lot better. We, we know that they'll get a lot better if you make them multimodal. So GPT-4 was trained with images as well as words. And it's possible that Google's doing the same thing. Um, so I think, particularly when they're multimodal, they could learn much, much more than us. And if you play with GPT-4, it's very hard not to believe that it's already fairly intelligent. So there's people I, I respect a lot, like Jan LeCun, who think it doesn't really understand what it's saying. But I don't understand how he can believe that, because you can give it little puzzles. And if it doesn't really understand, if it's just a sort of stochastic parrot that's doing autocomplete, I don't see how it can solve puzzles of a form it's never seen before. So I've got a friend who's in symbolic AI, and um, he's called Hector Levesque, and he's got a lot of integrity, so he doesn't want to change the goalposts all the time. He's, he's now very surprised that they can do this, and he admits he's very surprised that neural nets can do it, and he can't understand how such a stupid method can deal with reasoning, little bits of reasoning. So he asked me to give GPT-4 a problem, and I made the problem more difficult because I knew it would be able to do his problem. And I gave it the problem. Um, the rooms in my house are painted white or blue or yellow. Um, yellow paint fades to white within a year. And in two years' time, I'd like them all to be white. What should I do? And what you would say is you should paint the blue rooms white. Um, but if you're a mathematician, you might say you should paint the blue rooms yellow because that reduces it to an already solved problem, because you know that the yellow goes to white. And GPT-4 actually gave the mathematician solution. It said, paint the blue rooms yellow. Um, but the point is, I don't see how it could have done that without understanding. And there's all these other things where you, you tell it to write code to produce a diagram, and it produces a diagram. So I don't understand how Yang can think they don't understand. Um, he's probably giving a lecture the other way around right now. <laughs> So this made me believe that these things can get more intelligent than us, and it might happen quite soon. I'd always believed it was like 50 to 100 years, or 30 to 100 years, or 30 to 50 years. I think I said different things at different times. Um, but now I believe it's like 5 to 20. I think it's going to happen fairly soon. And if it's going to happen in five years' time, um, we can't just leave it to philosophers to decide what to do about it. It's time we actually got some practical experience. So what I believe is, um, well, let me finish this slide, that people are going to not be able to resist giving these things goals. Obviously, you want them to do things, you give them goals. And if you want them to be good at achieving goals, you give them the ability to create sub-goals. And as soon as you have the ability to create a sub-goal, if you're intelligent, you'll realize that a very good sub-goal is to get more control because that helps you achieve all your other goals.